see a lot of familiar faces in the audience. Uh, I'll make a couple of points before we get into our talk. Um, Mr. McGeehan, I want to thank him for his testimonial, made, made a great point. Um, empowering yourself is huge. Um, made a point about uh, he's recently had spots frozen on his scalp, which is Dr. Miller is going to discuss many of the ways in which we can treat these precancers and cancerous lesions. Freezing, which some of you may have had done before, destroys some of the precancers. Um, but it's important to understand that when you have certain treatments, if they don't seem to be working, it's time to um, make that a note to, to your physician. So thank, thanks for pointing that out, um, where you know, empowering yourself is, is hugely important. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Miller. He's not in the room anymore, so I can say this. Oh, there he is. Uh, it's an honor to, uh, to work beside him. As you can tell, I mean, I consider him, as well as many of our field, as probably uh, the, one of the best uh, Mohs and reconstructive surgeons in the country. So it really is an honor to work beside him on a daily basis. We have a great time. Our, our staff is here having a great time. So we're going to start. I, I'm sort of uh, taken aback by the heartfelt testimonials that you have. So. During the break, I inserted a slide to make it my first slide as my own testimonial. This is a fact um, that I currently, at the University of Pennsylvania, am a Mosin reconstructive surgeon. But my testimonial is that I've not always been a Mosin reconstructive surgeon. Uh, I've uh, been ignorant to the toxic nature of the sun, particularly as a youth. And so I can tell you, although I can't say it in the present terms, I know in 15 to 20 years, when I'm going to get my first melanoma and where it's going to occur in my body. Because when I was 18 and I made my first trip to Miami, I had a blistering burn on my trunk and it was not pleasant. And so I, I would say that if it wasn't for going through medical school and dermatology residency and seeing these spots every day, and probably more importantly, seeing what's necessary sometimes to remove some of these uh, challenging tumors, um, I wouldn't have changed my ways. So I think it's important that Everyone in this, here, in this room obviously has a ton of education, so hopefully you can spread the word to, to your friends and family members, helping educate them. We're going to have a little bit of fun right now, and we're going to play a couple of game shows during the next 20 minutes of the ultraviolet uh, light talk. So we're going to play the skin cancer Jeopardy, and we're going to stick to the first column over here. We're going to ask about ultraviolet light or light in general, okay? And so the fact that the audience participation was so strong early in the beginning, I don't have to be concerned about one, people participating, two, knowing the answer. So this, this should be pretty easy and, and pretty fun. So Alex is saying that the first question is light for 100. This non-ionizing electromagnetic form of radiation is invisible, and its name be means beyond violet. Ultraviolet, ultraviolet. fantastic. You guys can see how I'm fluctuating between the Trebek with the stash and without the stash. Personally, I'm a stash fan of the Trebek, and he's actually since grown it back, which I saw recently with the Wheat Thins commercial, which is pretty funny. I think we're going to go light for 200, Alex. <laughs> so this is the main environmental source of ultraviolet light. And this is correct. So we're going to be stating in the form of a question, because if we said the sun, that would not be correct, all right? OK. So Ultraviolet light, the main source of it, is the sun. The ultraviolet light that we get from the sun varies on a number of different factors, many of which you're probably aware of. If you're not sort of uh, cognizant of it, you're probably, you can intuit it. So the altitude, the reflection from certain things, the time of the year, day, uh, latitude, and weather are all of these factors which will give you a different amount of ultraviolet light. So the sun is the highest in the sky around noon, which means that in the early morning, there is sun and there is ultraviolet light, but when it's directly overhead, you can see that the distance to the Earth is shorter. And so in terms of that, if we measure it, the sun's rays are strongest. So I'm saying noon, but that doesn't mean you need, doesn't necessarily mean that it's only at noon. As it progresses toward noon, so from 10 till uh, sort of progressing away from noon till about 4 p.m., is when we say that the ultraviolet rays are the strongest. And so in terms of protecting our skin, this is when we need to be most diligent. The sun's angle varies with the seasons, so we can see how it's on its axis. And based on that, there's going to be varying amounts of ultraviolet intensity, meaning that the sun is strongest and the ultraviolet rays are the strongest in the summertime. This is something that we're all aware of. 
in addition, uh, the ultraviolet rays and the sunlight, um, I say here, has more attitude at a certain latitude, I'm trying to spice it up a little bit. But that basically means that as we get closer to the equator, the ultraviolet rays are the strongest. And Antarctica, which is farthest away, um, ultraviolet rays are probably not as strong. Then if you calculate in the ozone, that's a different story, which we'll get to in a bit. As we get to certain altitudes, uh, as we get higher and higher, so I don't, this might be Mount Everest or a representation of it, the higher we get up, the stronger the ultraviolet rays are. And again, the more diligent we need to be in terms of protecting our skin. That said, you know, we often hear in our practice that you know, even though it might be a, uh, a middle of July, a noon, if it's a cloudy day or it might be raining, you say, well, you know, why would I need to put on sunscreen? We say, let's put on sunscreen every day to protect our skin, but if I'm not seeing the sun, why would I do it? Well, just because there are clouds out there and we're not seeing the sun does not necessarily mean that those ultraviolet rays are not penetrating through those clouds. Equally as important is if you are covered up, right, it might not be a cloudy day, but you say, you know, I'm uh, protecting myself a number of other different ways. I'm under a shade um, on the beach. There are other ways in which the ultraviolet light can get you. It might not just necessarily be from the top. It can go to areas like the ocean or the sand or the pavement and reflect off and get our skin. So if you're not protecting yourself from the sun, you're getting a double dose from above and from the sides and below. And so this is an example where, you know, this is sort of probably everyone's picture of paradise here. And we can do this in a very responsible fashion. But just because you're under shade doesn't necessarily mean that you're fully protected. Any questions from, from that? All right. I think, Alex, we're going to go for light for 300. All right. This, this was a, uh, if you, if, we should know this based on the very first presentation because it was sort of hinted in there. But these are commonly known as A, B, and C. All right, good. Uh, what are the three forms of ultraviolet light? That's sort of a little esoteric. And, but it's important that we recognize that there are three forms because we're, when we go to light for 400, the answer is this layer blocks 97 to 99% of the sun's ultraviolet light through, uh, from penetrating through the Earth's atmosphere. Who is the ozone? Yes, okay. So we're back to the Trebek with the stash here. This is great, clap it up. Um, the reason why it's important to understand that there are three forms of ultraviolet light, the A, B, and C, is that they're not all the same, okay? And I took out some of the slides that deal with the science behind the electromagnetic spectrum and the specific wavelength of light. But it is important to recognize that ultraviolet C is blocked out from the ozone and ultraviolet B is filtered out. So we do get some ultraviolet B. Ultraviolet A, its wavelength is the longest, which means that although it might have the least energy, it penetrates the deepest through, this, through the Earth's layer and into the skin. So this is, you know, this is sort of a paradigm. Uh, the larger the wavelength, the deeper it will penetrate. And we're going to touch on the difference between ultraviolet A and B. They do sort of do the similar thing. A, we like to think, ages the skin more. B is bad, so it might cause more skin cancer. But all told, both can do the same thing. One will do more of, they sort of complement each other. All right, I think we're going to go to light for 500, Alex. I don't have a daily double in here. I should have put it one in, I'm realizing now. So this cell is found in the skin, and one of its purposes is to protect the skin by absorbing ultraviolet light. This is probably another esoteric question. Melanin. Melanin, which is produced by this particular cell, which we saw at the bottom of the brick layer that Dr. Miller presented. Melanocyte. Melanocyte, exactly. OK, so here's a fancy picture. And you know we're not going to get into all the histology behind it. But let's focus. Let's take a little schematic, OK? So each of these cells has DNA, all right? And when we look inside that cell, that DNA has a particular appearance. When we get ultraviolet light from its main source, the sun, and if we imagine that this is the DNA within a melanocyte, okay, there's damage that occurs there. When our cells get damaged from any number of toxins, we're using ultraviolet light as an example, it's going to do one of three things. Okay? The thing that it does most commonly are the first two things. It's either going to, the cell is, itself is going to commit suicide. It's got a fancy name called apoptosis, all right? which sounds like a bad thing, but is actually preventing this damage from perpetuating down a line. Or we have the intrinsic nature to repair that damage. Now, if you put this together with what Dr. Miller had mentioned with patients on immunosuppressive medications, you're dampening the ability to repair that damage. You're, you're basically not able to repair it. So these two ways prevent 
this from happening, which is what we don't want. So you get ultraviolet light damaging the DNA. If you, the cell can't commit suicide or can't fix itself, it's going to replicate with the potential to develop a malignancy. And this is how we get skin cancer. This is how we get melanoma. This is not a skin cancer that we would like to get. Okay. Early on, there were many primitive ways that we could protect our cells from ultraviolet damage. So if we believe evolution, we all had fur. Okay. Now, we've since dropped the fur and we've evolved. Okay. Um, but we still have vestigial remnants from those days that can protect our cells from the ultraviolet damage. You know, whether it be the hair on our scalp or, you know, s some, ha you know, I'm supposed to mention in the audience, we, we were talking about earlier, I'm sure, you know, some, some spouses can, can attest to their husbands having hair on their backs. These are other ways that the ultraviolet light can protect the cells from the sun. But if we look at the skin in a cross section here, okay, we said that there are three different, wa three different wavelengths of ultraviolet light, A, B, and C. They'll penetrate through the ozone layer to a certain extent. Ultraviolet C really doesn't see our skin because it's not getting into the atmosphere. Ultraviolet B, its wavelength is shorter, so it's going to get to only a certain depth here. Ultraviolet A penetrates through a little bit deeper. Okay? And so let's focus on this melanocyte, okay? the pigment producing cell in the skin that when it has malignant potential will be develop a melanoma. If we look at this cell in its normal form, it has particular elements in it. The names are melanosomes. That doesn't matter here, okay? But what is important is what happens when the sun hits this cell. So as that sun gets, the ultraviolet light gets to those cells, what happens is these melanosomes increase in number, all right? Anyone in the audience know what happens when these melanosomes increase in number and they start producing more melanin to its surrounding contents? Tanning, exactly, okay? So our skin goes from sort of milky and healthy white like this to we get some light and we develop sort of this golden bronze tan, which I would say, you know, if we look to the left and right side, our society would say, you know, both would, you know, there are probably two schools of thought, but some would agree that, you know, a bronze color like this is attractive. However, this is gonna look good until we get leathery skin, we get aging, we get wrinkles, uh, we get sunspots, and we get skin cancer. Okay, so we've played, the f we've played Jeopardy so far. What I think we're gonna do right now is we're gonna play The Feud, okay? So we're gonna do a lot of game shows. So we're gonna play Let's Dispel the Myths Feud, all right? And I've got, I'm mic'd up here, um, so I might walk around the audience and ask for some uh, answers, we'll see. Okay. So we've got four uh, different age groups here, okay? So there's a myth that gets perpetuated. Anyone in the audience know the answer to this uh, question? How old are we when we accumulate 80% of our lifetime sun exposure? Mr. Lakin. Very, very, very young. Very young, okay. So this is good. Anyone else? 20. At 20 years old? Okay. So what's that? The child, okay, so this is good. So this is, I think this is something that, uh, it's great that we're playing this game, okay? I think everyone agrees? Okay, so we're gonna go survey says. Okay, so it's actually number three. And so here's the myth. It's been perpetuated for decades that by the time we're 18, we get the majority of the sun exposure in our life, okay? And this is simply not true. And it's something that I think is important we all recognize in the room because um, there are many um, cognitive dissonant measures where we try and convince ourselves that certain things are true so that we can adhere to certain behaviors that we like, okay? So if we all think that we've gotten the majority of our sun exposure at 18 years old, we say, well, what's the point? Why do I need to protect myself in, from my skin in my 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s? And it's important to know that if you've had a skin cancer in your 30s and 40s and 50s, the sun protection is even more important, okay? Because you might not be able to prevent the damage that's occurred, but you can certainly prevent further damage from occurring, okay? So about 25% of our lifetime exposure of ultraviolet light occurs by the time we're 18. If we look at it, the simplest way of breaking it down is every 20 years, we probably get about 25% more sun exposure, okay? So those of us in the audience who sort of fall in, in this category here in the 50s might have gotten close to 80% uh, of the exposure. And this is all based on an 80 year lifespan, which probably, you know, we're gonna go far beyond that. Okay, so this is good. We're, we're liking the let's dispel the myths feud. Let's go to the next question. So here, um, 
might be a myth that some of you have heard. Okay? Many say that getting a tan or a base tan at the tanning salon helps prevent future burns at the beach. That's fall. Okay, survey says that everyone in the room is right. Okay. So sunburns are due to ultraviolet light. When we look at the A, B, and C portions of ultraviolet light, it's mostly B. Okay. Uh, we like to remember B stands. B stands for bad. Okay. B is going to cause more of the skin cancers. B is going to cause more of the burns. <clears throat> Tanning beds are going to emit ultraviolet light, but they tend to emit ultraviolet A. And so if you're if you've got family members or friends or people that you know that are going to the tanning salon because they say, well, I'm going to the beach, I want to get a base tan, they're actually five to ten times less protected from that base tan that they've gotten from the salon. Ultraviolet A tan tends not to protect as well as an ultraviolet B tan, and which we'll see with the remainder of this lecture that pretty much all tans are bad. All right, we're going to go, I think everyone knows this right now, sunburns, aging skin, skin cancer. Ultraviolet A and B are going to cause which of the following? The, any of those or all of the above? Okay, survey says that's an easy one. So half of U.S. adults under 30 say that they've had a sunburn at least once in the previous year. Okay, so the point is, if everyone, if people that are fairly young know this, if we're getting this information out there that they're going to get premature aging, that they're going to get skin cancer, okay, and that they potentially get sunburned. This is a child burning the hand on the stove. It's important that we can try and help people prevent mistakes that could have been prevented. We should learn from uh, our prior generations. All right. Many say that tanning and tanning booths and beds is safe since that the uh, ultraviolet exposure is regulated. Is this correct? False. false. Survey says false. Okay. So here, here are a couple of points here. There's a term right now that's being thrown around in the dermatologic community, prom melanoma. So what is a prom melanoma? Okay. Well, Everyone wants to look good for their big day, whether prom or, or wedding, et cetera. And many people think that having a tanned appearance looks better. What we know now is, you know, without reading the fine print, tanning and tanning beds causes melanoma, period, regardless what the tanning industry will lead you to believe. And Dr. Miller pointed this out earlier. 2% of the people born today are going to have a 1 in 50 chance, or 2% of those people are going to get a melanoma at some point in their life. That's pretty high. And it's an epidemic right now. It's a public health problem. Melanoma is increasing faster than any other cancer. I put a little thing here. Why don't you tweet that? I've never tweeted myself, OK? I don't know what it does, but um, I think we're actually tweeting this right now, believe it or not. Uh, this should be tweeted, OK? The, the highest, the melanoma is the most common form of cancer in young adults, OK? 25 to 29, and it's the second most common form in teens up to 29 years old, okay? And that's almost certainly uh, something that needs to be addressed. We're trying to do it by getting the word out, but sun protection is huge, and we're going to get into that in the next lecture. Men get melanoma more than women, and the older we get, men are more likely to get a melanoma. I say that because this is an important point. Without focusing on this graph too much, I want us to dial in to this here. Red is women, blue is men. This is the only area where women outweigh men in the likelihood of getting melanoma. Why is that? Okay, In the teens to 20s to early 30s, women are getting melanoma at an extraordinarily high rate, and it's an epidemic. And I, I think we can pretty much attribute it a large amount to the tanning bed use that's occurred in the United States in the past 20 to 30 years. And you can see here that these numbers are astronomical, the amount that it's increasing. 30, 30 million people are tanning in the US every year, and about 2 million of them are teens. Okay, and um, this is Kanye making it rain because that's what's happening with the tanning bed industry. They make five billion dollars a year. That's outrageous. Okay, so they're not laughing matters. Seventy-one percent of tanning salon patrons are women and they're teens in their twenties. Okay, and indoor UV tanners are seventy-five percent more likely to develop melanoma than those who have never tanned before. Okay, this is something that gets repeated over and over again. So I think we're going to play another thing called really right now. This is, we're just going to make a couple of interesting points. So really, did you know that the FDA classifies tanning beds as a class one medical device? And so this is when we say really, because class one medical devices from the FDA are also tongue depressors, really. Because the International Agency for Research on Cancer groups tanning beds as a group one substance, really because cigarettes are classified as a group one substance as well. And so I show these slides because there's a huge disconnect right here, okay, because the FDA has not 
made as strong as a stance as we should right now on tanning boots because what else is a group one substance? Alpha and beta, beta particle emitters, x-rays and gamma rays, neutron radiation, okay? And tanning beds are in there. So when we drive by and we see these tanning boots that are on every corner and we realize it's $5 billion a year, something needs to be done. So, okay, 36 states right now. This, you guys know I had to show this slide. This is the Crispus photo, believe it or not. That is what we were talking about, pink and shiny. That's, that's dull and leathery. But 36 states are currently restricting indoor tanning use by minors, all right? And so if we look at it right now, they're prohibiting the amount that you do. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to play the feud a little bit more right now. Many say that laying out in the sun is actually safe because it ensures that we get adequate amounts of vitamin D. False. Okay. That's correct. So um, we're going to talk about vitamin D here because I'm sure that many in the audience have questions about the controversy that's going on. And I'm going to try and, I'm going to try and represent the most objective form of slides. And even in my most objective terms, it's very difficult trying to, when the evidence so far outweighs one versus the other, it's hard to sound objective. But what we're going to do here is present a couple of things that have been found on the internet. So if you Google vitamin D in ultraviolet light, this is the second hit on Google, okay? Which is, I would imagine, I don't tweet and I don't Facebook, but I think everyone in the room probably Googles at some point. This is a physician who, I'm not even going to say the website because I don't want anyone to go there and believe anything that's written. But he, he puts up three things on his website. Okay, the first is that he states, it's nearly impossible to get adequate amounts of vitamin D from your diet. Sunlight exposure is the only reliable way to generate vitamin D in your own body. This is really egregious, okay? We're going to go to the next one, which gets worse. Point number nine he makes here. Even weak sunscreens with an SPF of eight, and we're going to talk about sunscreens in the next lecture, block your ability to generate vitamin D by 95%. This is how sunscreen products actually cause disease by creating a critical vitamin deficiency in the body. He's actually making a cause-effect relationship between sunscreen and vitamin deficiency. It's like my stomach is churning right now. So here's the third point. It's impossible to generate too much vitamin D in your body from sunlight exposure. Your body will self-regulate and only generate what it needs. So when I read that, I sort of read between the lines and, and, and say, actually saying like go out and get more and more sun to get more vitamin D because we're going to get everything that vitamin D you know, does for us. Well, here's the fact, okay? I'm going to calm down after reading those three points. Vitamin D do, does play a crucial role in our body. It maintains strong and healthy bones. And it is, an, it is a fact that we do need ultraviolet light from the sun to help convert a precursor of vitamin D into an active form. So what does vitamin D do in our body? What, what does it actually do that scientifically we know? It produces strong bones. It helps absorb calcium and regulates phosphorus, OK? By a large amount, it does it more than any other chemical in the body, OK? Now, because of that, there have been some studies that have been done, and there's been some research uh, papers presented in various specialty journals showing that vitamin D might be associated with certain cancers. So some, some studies have shown if you've got low vitamin D, you might be more likely to get certain cancers, or you might have a worse survival. Some studies have shown, well, if you have low vitamin D, you might be more likely to get certain neurologic disease or cardiovascular disease. It's made people go crazy. So, because of these studies are saying, well, maybe vitamin D might be associated with these things, we obviously need more vitamin D. But there's never been a study to show more vitamin D is actually preventing cancer or making you survive cancer better, OK? This is the most important thing. This is the most objective thing that's going to be said about vitamin D right now. Okay, the Institute of Medicine, which is probably the most respe respected body across all the specialties, says that at this point right now, the only thing that we know is that vitamin D um, is going to give you strong bones. Anything that's related to non-bone non health outcomes, okay, cancer, cardiovascular disease, neurovascular disease, it's inconclusive, okay, whether or not it's a cause and effect relationship. So there are three four sources of vitamin D, okay? We can get it from sunlight, ultraviolet B, but we can also get it from certain fortified foods, and we can also get it from certain vitamin D supplementation. It's like beating a dead horse, okay? Ultraviolet light is bad. And that, that basically, I think that's going to get tweeted as well, OK? And it's well established that if we get sun, or if we get, if we get ultraviolet rays from the sun in excess, or if we go to tanning boots, 
we're going to increase the risk of skin cancer. So of those three forms of production of vitamin D, ultraviolet rays, which is the safest, okay? The, fort the fortified supplementation and the vitamins, okay? <clears throat> so it's a safe way of obtaining vitamin D through the diet. We know that we can get adequate amounts of vitamin D through our diet and through supplementation um, and without getting the risk of skin cancer. And I didn't put the table up of, you know, how many units you get per food. Salmon has a lot of vitamin D. But if you have a healthy diet, you're almost certainly getting a, a large amount of vitamin D. The amount of vitamin D that you need, this is something you should speak to your doctors about. It varies by your age. The older you are, the closer you get to needing 800 units. Most people need about 600 units. If you have a good diet, okay, it'll probably get you enough. But have, taking some vitamin D supplementation will definitely get you there, okay? So here's a recap for the ultraviolet talk. Here are the facts. The sun is our main source of ultraviolet light. We saw that in the Celebrity Jeopardy. Ultraviolet light makes us old and it gives us skin cancer. These are facts. All artificial ultraviolet light is even worse than the ultraviolet light that you get from the sun. And vitamin D gives us strong bones. We don't need the sun to get, we don't need excess sun to get vitamin D. We can get a sufficient amount through our diet, okay? There were studies recently to show that if you put on too much sunscreen, if you live in the Northeast, you might not get it. But the bottom line is if a little bit of your skin sees a little bit of ultraviolet light on a daily basis, okay? If you're not living in a cave, that's enough ultraviolet light to get you the vitamin D you need with a healthy diet, okay? So here's the $64,000 question. If we know that ultraviolet light is toxic to our skin, how do we protect ourselves from those toxic rays? Well, this is the second portion of the talk, okay? We're gonna try and develop a comprehensive strategy to protect our, our skin from the sun. Any questions on the last talk? Yes? How much sun, not the most the sun, how much sun of the other time is sufficient for your body to make vitamin D? So the, the studies that I've read, and you can't quote me on this because I haven't read it in a while, but if, I think it's the back of your hand sees sun for 15 minutes in a day every day, that's enough. Yes? I should have repeated the question, how much sun is safe? And that was the answer, so, yeah. You get a suntan, you're producing more skin uh, melanin. So, and, so and, and we know that in the darker skin communities, that does protect them from the skin cancers. So I guess that's probably the thought that if you have the uh, suntan to begin with, you'll have a protection from sun rays after that because you will have built up some of the tanning at the level of the skin. That's just kind of like a thought. And the other thing, um, oral uh, melatonin, that's, that's used for uh, sleep. Mm -hmm. um, I read studies many years ago, just a little uh, the question of if you supplement melatonin, could it possibly make you at, at increased risk for um, cancer? And, uh, but now I'm wondering, is there a possibility of uh, that being protective for okay. skin cancer? Great, so to address the first question, um, when we look at risk factors for developing skin cancer, skin type, what we call Fitzpatrick skin type, is heavily plays a role in who is most likely to get, let's say, let's just focus on melanoma, for example, although it probably applies across the board. Patients who have type one skin, Anglo-Saxon, Caucasian, very, very light skin, have the highest likelihood of developing a melanoma. Patients who have darker skin, African-American patients, are exceedingly unlikely to get that same type of melanoma. They can get melanoma. The melanomas that they tend to get tend to be on the hands and feet under the nails, okay? Um, but anyone can get any skin cancer anywhere. <sighs> Protecting the, the tan that we get, the, I, that was a sort of very simplified version of what happens when we get acute sunlight. When we get acute sunlight, what happens is not only do those melanosomes increase in number, they produce more melanin. That melanin is a particle that goes out to the rest of the skin, and that's what pigments are, are um, our skin from the outside, okay? Um, and in the most acute sense, okay, you might get protection from ultraviolet B early on. But over time, as you accumulate the, the sun damage from the ultraviolet rays, not only do you increase the melanosomes and the dispensation of the melanin to the cells, you're also increasing the number of melanocytes, okay, which is one, and you're also increasing the number, uh, the damage that you get to the cells. And that's important for two reasons. Does everyone remember the slide that Dr. Miller showed with the patient who had the melanoma on the eyelid? Okay, and actually the same one that I had here. 
so as we get older, the melanoma that we tend to get shifts toward the melanoma of the head and neck, and it's a different type, okay? What we see is that the melanocytes, those cells themselves, actually increase in number. And as they increase in number, they percolate up into the skin and have the potential to become melanoma. So early on, the effects are bad because you're damaging the cells itself. You're damaging the DNA. So early on, you, yeah, you might help prevent further burns. And so that, that is true. But you're actually damaging the cells more to produce more likely developing of melanoma and more likely developing <coughs> basal cell and squamous cell. And so it's the example that patients in their 60s and 70s, it, sun protection is so important, which we're going to get to in a moment. And I, I, I'm sort of like a broken record. Although you ha have had a lot of sun damage, I'll tell my patients, you can definitely prevent further damage. But there's no way you can prevent the damage from these acute burns or the early tanning that's occurred. Okay? So early on, it might have helped prevent burns, but it subsequently will lead to cancer 10, 20, many decades later. That's a, those are great questions. In terms of melatonin and regulation of the circadian rhythm, I'm not familiar with literature that is either protective or a risk factor for developing skin cancer. It, which ultraviolet rays can or cannot pass through car windows? And that's a great point. So if you remember, UVA is the one that goes all the way through the ozone. UVB gets filtered out through the ozone. It, the same thing occurs with uh, windows. So ultraviolet A can actually go through the windows. UVB tends not to. And so patients who are, have photosensitizing disorders, sometimes they'll need to get UVA protective shields for it. And so, but that's a great point. Um, you can get, just because you're sitting by a window doesn't mean you're not getting ultraviolet rays. Okay, I will go last question because I think uh, we're trying to, go ahead. That's a great question. So you're talking about sort of protecting the eyes from the ultraviolet rays. Um, I, this is a question I, I, I'm going to give an answer. The question is, are the, the sunglasses that we use, are the less expensive ones as good as the more expensive ones? Or are the expensive ones actually helping us more or not? Uh, without being familiar with the, ocula, uh, the ophthalmology literature, I can say that protecting your eyes is important. Wearing sunglasses is good. There are some different filters. Some might be polarized and not. I'm not familiar if the more expensive ones work that much better. I can tell you, I, I do a good amount of, uh, of cosmetic work, and patients come in and say, I buy products from CVS, or can I buy you know, X product that costs $5,000? It's been my experience that it's moisturizing the skin, it's doing the same thing. It doesn't matter if it has you know, you know, whale caviar mixed in with it. It's going to do the same thing. So that's my take, but that's, I would, I'm going to have to ask my colleagues in ophthalmology if they have a better answer, more sophisticated answer. I, I, okay. I can actually oh. answer that. Uh, polycarbonate lenses will block the UV light. Glass won't. Glass depends on the coating on it. And as he said, the UVA particularly will go through the glass. Uh, the other thing you have to be careful of, if you have glasses that aren't, that don't protect your eyes from UV light but are dark, they make your pupils expand. So you're actually likely to do more damage. So you may want to make sure when you buy glasses that it says that it protects you from UV light. Okay, excellent. That's a lot. Last one. Uh, is it not important to tell all people, regardless of their complexion or quote their color, that anybody can get skin cancer? It isn't like some groups are exempt because of their particular wherever they fit in the spectrum of human possibility. I agree 100%. And this is, it's so important that we educate ourselves at this, everyone here. You know, it's been a delicate balance, Dr. Miller and I, putting these slides together because we want to do it in an educative way. We don't want to do it in a scary way. So that I, the same thing applies for our patients. You know, education is so empowering. If, you, if a patient sits down and says, you know, you're at risk for, if I say you're at risk for skin cancer, in that way it's, um, it's not meant to be scary, but it definitely, by educating everyone, saying these are things you should look out for, you are more at risk for skin cancer type A, but you can get skin cancer type B and C. Skin cancer A is more likely to occur in this location, but you can get it anywhere. So the importance of being here can't be overestimated, and everyone here is making great points, so thank you for that. What I think we're going to do is we, we talked about the harmful rays of the sun and all the ultraviolet light and how terribly bad, particularly artificial tanning is. How do we protect our skin from those artificial rays or the harmful rays of the sun? Well, here's two pie charts broken up. 
And there, it's a busy slide. I've highlighted three different types of cancer on the spectrum. And the cancers that are registered in the United States, if we look at the most common type of cancer in men and women, most common cancer in men is prostate cancer. The most common type of cancer in women is breast cancer. Lung and colorectal cancer sort of round out number two and three for both of them. But that's for registered cancers. The one thing that this slide won't tell you is that if you look at basal cell and squamous cell, basal cell is the most common cancer in humans, but it's not tabulated the way these other cancers are, so it's sort of deceiving. The point I do want to make here, though, since we're talking about melanoma so much, is when we look at melanoma, melanoma falls in the category of the, probably the sixth or seventh most common cancer in men and women, okay? But there's about 125,000 new cases occurring each year in the, in the United States. Of those, 9,000 will result in death a year, okay? So when you sort of tabulate it out, one person is gonna die of melanoma every hour, all right? And so melanoma accounts for less than 5% of skin cancers. It's causing 75% of those deaths from skin cancer. The one thing that we do know, and it's proven over and over again, is that in terms of risk reduction, sun avoidance and protection from the sun are the best ways to reduce that risk, right? We said 2% of people born today are gonna develop a melanoma. Well, by protecting from the sun, it helps reduce that risk. The simplest way of thinking about it is tiers of th a three-tiered system. And the most important one of this tier is gonna be sitting at the base of our hierarchy of photo protection. Sun avoidance is the absolute most important thing that we can do to protect ourselves from the sun. All right, it's the only foolproof plan. And we talked about how the sun is strongest from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And so doing your best to avoid the sun and protect your skin at, during those hours is paramount. And why is that? If you remember the slide showing you that the harmful rays from the sun get closer and closer to the Earth's surface as it gets closer and closer to noon, it really is important to protect our skin uh, during those hours. So what are ways that we can avoid the sun? You know, we say, well, it's, it's approaching summertime right now. I run to and from my car. I pick my kids up, grandkids up from, you know, whatever. I'm watching them play sports. We're in the backyard. They're at the pool. We're going to the shore on the weekends. How can I avoid it? It's everywhere. And I agree with you. It can seem overwhelming, but when you step back, Okay, and you think in the back of your minds, you know, it really is important to protect our, my, my skin and it can be done in a very easy way. Here are three easy ways to do it. Okay, so let's look at common scenarios. We're at the playground with our children and grandchildren, right? How can we protect them and protect our own skin? Well, the AAD has a shade structure program where they're sponsoring programs in various communities to allow children and allow you to play with your family members in a way that's outdoors, that's safe and responsible, okay? The weather is great, if it's 75 degrees, you wanna be outside, but you wanna make sure it's done in a responsible way. So that's the playground, okay? And if, if, you, don't, if you have a playground nearby who's got, who has this, I would encourage you to, to go to that one rather than one that might be closer and not protected. What about playing sports? It's common for, you know, many of us in the audience may do a lot of act, outdoor activities, bocce, gardening, okay? We might go with family members to watch them play sports. Here's a website um, that's shadestructures.net, okay? But if you Google anything shade structure in sports, there are a number of different ways that we can encourage our community to create structures like this that allow us to do outdoor sports but in a safe and responsible way, okay? This is just one of many examples of having the bleachers covered by a shade protective structure. So we've got playground, we've got playing sports, gardening, okay? What about the pool, the pool or the beach? This is such a common way that we can get excess amounts of UV light. Well, here's an, just one example where in your backyard, okay, you can be outdoors, you can enjoy the great weather, but if you know that from 10 to 4 in your backyard that sun is beaming over, there's no reason to not put out a shade structure like that, okay? So that's the, the very essence of the best way to protect your skin from the sun and the ultraviolet rays, avoiding the sun. Now, it's not practical. You can't think that you're going to avoid every single ounce of ultraviolet light, and we know we probably do need a little bit of UV light as we talked about the vitamin D issue. But if you're going to be outdoors and you can't totally avoid the sunlight, you might want to use sun protective clothing, all right? So, and protection shouldn't be really that hard. There are a lot of activities that we do. We're outdoors, we're skiing, we wear goggles, we wear helmets and protective equipment. Okay, Bernie Perron presented here at our melanoma conference last year. All of these things that are outdoors or, you know, activities, we're protecting ourselves from injury. Well, the sun is no different. The sun is in injurious to our skin. So hats and various other forms of ultraviolet protective clothing are out there. There are many different websites, you know, I would encourage you to test them out, okay? 
um, and see what works for you, but they, they will absolutely work better than sunscreen, okay? Sunscreen have various amounts of SPF, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but it's gonna work so much better. Avoiding the sun works best. Using clothing goes so much farther than sunscreen. So here's one form, okay? Here's another. This website gives eight great reasons why you should wear uh, this particular brand, okay? And all of these probably apply to all the various other brands, okay? And you can be stylish. This is a patient who is uh, uh, developed a melanoma, and uh, she, she, you know, uh, is actually I think a vendor currently. But there are ways that you can do this that you know, if you listen to Ashley Schaefer, have luxury and elegance to it. Okay, and the bottom line is that it doesn't necessarily need to not be fashionable. There are many different ways of of protecting your sun in a way that is comfortable and looks good. All right, here's another form, and this one says it's 100 plus SPF. Okay. So what does that even mean? What is the difference between 10 and 100? And is SPF, is this magical thing? SPF is not magic, OK? Um, SPF is basically going to indicate how well that particular product that you're using prevents a sunburn, period, OK? Doesn't necessarily mean it's preventing skin cancer. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to definitely prevent a sunburn, but it tells you how likely it is to, to prevent it. And so it doesn't just apply to sunscreen. It applies to any product, OK? Um, it applies to the clothing that I had just me uh, mentioned. And it really is just the measure of ultraviolet B. Remember the B stands for bad, burns, uh, okay? So that's sun protective clothing. Those are the two most important things that you can do. And obviously, you know, sunscreen is probably the thing we use most commonly in the audience, so we'll, we'll talk about that. But look at where it fits in that, that hierarchy. It's the smallest uh, piece to that puzzle, okay? Let's look at that cross section of skin again and what happens when we get that ultraviolet light. All right, these cells get activated and um, you know, we're increasing melanosomes over time, we're increasing the number of melanocytes. What happens when we put sunscreen on? Well, here's just a bottle of generic brand that coats the layer of the upper layer of the skin. When that ultraviolet light hits that upper layer of skin, it reflects off, okay? And the, more, the, higher, the, the higher the strength of the SPF, the more likely the UVB is going to do that, okay? When used responsibly with other behaviors, sunscreen can decrease the number of, what is, what is this? Dr. Miller showed this earlier. These are? Exactly, precancers, okay? But it can also prevent pink shiny and bleeds easily. That's a basal cell. It can also prevent, this is fine white scale, bleeds easily. Squamous cell, okay? And then finally, sunscreen can help prevent melanoma. Excellent, okay? But there's tons of sunscreen out there. And this is, you know, if you Google best sunscreen, you're gonna get thousands of different websites trying to get you to buy one particular product. And the, really, there's only one answer. What's, what's the answer to the sunscreen that you should, you should use, the best, best sunscreen? OK, that, we're going to get to that. But there's an even more empirical answer. The sunscreen that you should use is the one that you're going to use. OK? I, really, OK? Cause I can tell you this, and I gave a testimonial in the first lecture about how I know my melanoma is going to happen right here. Hopefully, we'll pick it up early. Um, I'll give you another testament. If you gave me a bottle of sunscreen that was a cream, okay, I'm not going to put it on. Just not. I don't like that type of texture on my skin. I, I feel slimy, and it makes me not want to go out and enjoy the outdoor activities in a protected way, okay? But I know that if there's a spray sunscreen, I can spray it on and I feel infinitely better and I will use that sunscreen. That's how I protect my skin. Now, the spray issue is, is one thing. You have to make sure that when you spray it on, it's, you're getting on the right amount. But I know that's what works for me. The right one for you is the one that you will use. So I would encourage you to go out and try a number of different brands. Now, if you find one that you like, here are the three things that you want to look for, okay? You want to make sure that the SPF, the sun protective factor, the factor that tells you how much it's going to prevent a burn, is at least a 30, okay? A 30 tells you that you're 30 times less likely to burn. That's all. It doesn't tell you that you're not gonna get a burn. It doesn't tell you that um, you're not gonna get a melanoma, but it just tells you that you're 30 times less likely to burn. You wanna make sure that your sunscreen is broad spectrum, okay? And this is something that FDA, I'll get into in a moment, is encouraging um, sunscreen producers to do. That broad spectrum means that it's blocking out UVA and UVB. So although it might have seemed esoteric in the Celebrity Jeopardy, we were talking about UVA, UVB, and UVC, okay? We know that UVA is going to penetrate deeper, it can go through um, windows. UVB is, going to, is bad, it's going to burn us. Both of them are going to cause skin cancer. Both of them are going to cause skin aging. By blocking both of them out with a broad spectrum sunscreen, you're helping your skin. 
And then the final thing is, because we're sweating a lot outdoors in the sun, or you might be jumping in a pool, you want to do your best to make sure you're getting a water-resistant form. So those are the three essential elements. It doesn't matter if it's brand A or Z. Okay? And here, it, you know, I equate I equip this to you know, the, what Black Sheep said back in the 1990s. You know, the choice is yours, okay? Whether it's you know, various challenges here, pick the one that you like. All right? So um, there are many formulations. I told you that I can't put on a cream on, and I, I just won't. But for me, the spray is good. For you, the stick might be better, okay? Stick is good to use around the eyes. Uh, gel, if there are areas that, are, that are, have excess hair, you might want to try that. Uh, for dry skin, you might want to try creams that are a little bit more moisturizing. How much sunscreen should you put on? This is surprising to a lot of patients, okay? And depending upon which sort of uh, thought, you, thought spectrum you fall in, if a golf ball is a better reminder or a shot glass is a better reminder, the bottom line is, when we put on sunscreen, we know that we're not using the right amount. So if you wanted to cover yourself from head to toe, that's a good amount of sunscreen right there, okay? I'm sure uh, uh, someone in the back of the, their minds right now is saying, well, you know, I've got a great sunscreen from last summer. Should I use it again? The reason why it relates to this is if you still have sunscreen left over from last summer, you're not using enough, okay? And so the, that, that sort of uh, usurps that question from being asked. But the bottom line is make sure you're applying the adequate amount of sunscreen. All right. You want to make sure you're putting it on 15 minutes before you go outside so it can dry, and you reply every two hours um, uh, if you're going to be swimming and sweating. So we talked about the three most important things for sunscreen, broad spectrum, UVA, UVB, and SPF 30. Here are just a couple of elements that you might hear about in the news you've already heard about. When we look at sunscreens, okay, we want it to be at least an SPF 30. This is an SPF 15, but it says broad spectrum and it's water, water resistant. The FDA has said now that if the sunscreen is at least an SPF 15, okay, and it's broad spectrum, it's allowed to have this title on its bottle. That it reduces the risk of skin cancer and it reduces the risk of skin aging, okay? So the bottom line is SPF, this is, this is no secret, SPF 15 is really sufficient to protect our skin. The Academy of Dermatology recommends an SPF 30, anyone know why? Because they don't trust the public at large to put on the adequate amount. So by using 30, it sort of says, it sort of uh, it factors in that error. But if you use a good amount of sunscreen, SPF 15 is sufficient, okay? You just want to make sure that it's broad spectrum water resistant. If the bottle of sunscreen is not SPF 15, or it's not broad spectrum, it can't have that label, which means that it's unlikely to prevent skin cancer and it's unlikely to prevent skin aging, okay? So here's the other thing too. Um, if we look at that SPF 1000, what does that do? Nothing, right? So some of my patients say, sweet Venus, this is like, there's so many SPFs, like what do I do? Is 100 better than 500 better than 1000? And the bottom line is it's not, okay? When you get to an SPF of around here, right? 30 is blocking out so much of the ultraviolet rays. If you give another 5%, it's really not doing that much, okay? So the bottom line is SPF 30, broad spectrum, water resistant. Last two slides. We protect the most trivial things in our life. We bedazzle our iPhone covers, right? The iPhone probably is the greatest invention ever to come out, but do we really need to bedazzle the iPhone when we're not putting sunscreen on our skin when that matters the most, okay? Um, I had this slide up here, but the bottom line is I thank you all for coming, and um, I don't know if we have time for questions or not, but we're going to do patient testimonials. So, absolutely. What, what's the real answer about using last year's sunscreen? Take a board on sale. Okay, so here, here, here's the actual answer. So, um, if the, the consistency of the sunscreen is the same as it was before, and if it has an expiration date on it, and it's not expired, it certainly is safe to use. But the reason why I made that sort of underlying joke is um, we're, all of us in the room are not using the adequate amounts of sunscreen. Okay, I'd like to introduce, uh, or do you want? I'd like to introduce the, uh, the, the next uh, patient who's coming up. I think uh, Dr. Miller. Uh, yeah, so Mr. Truitt, uh, the way we had designed this initially, we had three patients who were gonna talk about different, each of the different stages of the, the talk. Mr. Truett's done an incredible job with his sun protection, so I wanted him to share his story and how that's made a difference for his, his life. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. 
Uh, I noticed when I was walking up in the parking lot that uh, one thing stood out me from everyone else. Does anyone know what that was? Yeah. I had a hat on. Because it is cumulative. So, you know, it's safer to be out in the morning, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't protect yourself. Um, also had a Jeopardy question. <laughs> Does anybody know what creature sees in the ultraviolet? You, bees use ultraviolet for vision. And what you see as a flower looks totally different to, uh, to a bee. It, it is actually almost like it has run rate, runway lights pointing it to where the nectar is. So on my Facebook page, I have something I call useless knowledge, and my wife says I'm an encyclopedia. <laughs> in uh, 1999, uh, November 1999, I, I experienced uh, end-stage renal failure. Uh, wasn't a surprise. I had had uh, uh, illnesses as a child that damaged my kidneys, and uh, over my adulthood, we were slowly watching the uh, function decrease. So uh, it was expected, um, but I had to go on dialysis. And uh, I was able to live my life as normal as I, as I could on dialysis, but uh, I was blessed by an older sister who donated a kidney to me. And uh, in June of 2000, I uh, received that kidney. Uh, however, I had a life full of sun because I'm an outdoors guy, uh, fishing, water skiing, uh, you name it, I like to do it outdoors in, uh, you know, middle of the day. And uh, I'm, of, I'm of the age where, like a lot of you out there, we didn't have sunblock or sunscreen when we were kids, so, you know, I burnt a lot. The doctors at Penn warned me that uh, one of the side effects of uh, the immune suppressant drugs was uh, an increase in skin cancer. And uh, that was certainly the case. Uh, it wasn't soon after my transplant that I started my battle with skin cancer. Um, so I, I decided that I had to learn all I could about skin cancer and how to protect myself. And uh, after I read as much as I could, I decided I'd take a three-pronged uh, approach to it. Number one, I'd avoid the sun, uh, particularly between 10 and 4, but uh, I would avoid the sun because it is cumulative, so I would try to get as little UV light as I could. Uh, being a fisherman, I had to change some habits of mine. So no mid-afternoon fishing. Fish in the morning, the afternoon. Now, uh, I have five cousins I go uh, fishing with twice a year, and uh, they unfortunately all tan. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to work very hard to convince them that we need to stay out of the sun in the midday and that we should fish in the morning come in, relax during the afternoon, and then go back out. But, you know, I managed to do it, and that's how we fish now. Uh, the other thing I decided is that uh, I would wear protective clothing. Uh, as you can see today, I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt. Uh, it's very rare, it has to be evening, for you to catch me in a short sleeve shirt. Uh, there's a lot of places, L.L. Bean, uh, Gander Mountain, they sell really nice, lightweight, long sleeve shirts. Uh, they have built-in sun protection. Uh, it only lasts for 15 washes. You'll see back there a product called SunGuard. I wash all my clothes with SunGuard because it builds in a uh, protection factor of 30. So, uh, you know, why not? And it lasts 20 washes, so only have to wash my clothes in it, you know, a couple times uh, during the summer, and uh, I feel like I've taken an extra step. The other thing I do is uh, when I do fish, I wear gloves because I want to protect the top of my hands. And uh, I have a finger cut out so I can still cast the fishing rod. You know, so I really think and uh, try and do as much as I can to protect myself. My last line of defense is sunscreens. Uh, I don't trust them. I'll be honest with you. I don't trust them. Uh, for me to, to think that the sun's rays are traveling uh, 93 million miles and then a microscopic film is going to reflect that light or absorb that light, protect my skin, uh, I don't totally buy it. I use it, 
because it's a line of defense. But I would rather trust avoidance and protecting my skin with clothing than I would counting on that sunscreen to do the job. So uh, that's, uh, that's why I've decided to uh, mount my fight against skin cancer. I also decided that I would be uh, part of my, I would be the main part of the team that uh, finds my skin cancers. So I get a map of my body and uh, in between visits with Dr. Miller, I mark out where I find things that I suspect could be skin cancer. Uh, you know, we talked about moles. One of the things I do with moles, because I'll tell you, every time you look at a mole, you'll think it looks different. You know, you just, oh man, and then you'll start to worry about it. So I take a six inch rule, I lay it next to my mole, and I take a digital picture of it. So then I have something as a baseline to say, hey, it's changed or no, it hasn't changed. I've been fortunate so far, I've, I haven't gotten any melanomas, but uh, I'm proactive and uh, I make sure that I'm watching out. Uh, you also notice that a lot of the slides were of people's backs. You're not going to check your own back. Your, uh, your job is a family affair. It's not just your job, okay? So you have to involve the whole family. I've taught my wife how to recognize skin cancers and she checks my back. So it really, it, it really is a family project. I do the same for her. I think that's about it. <laughs> yes. and thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Truitt? Uh, he's, he's, uh, it's rare to have somebody incorporate so faithfully and with such strict compliance all the possible ways that you can protect your skin from the sun. Immediately I thought of him. Uh, he's made a strong impression on me. And we need to figure out how to educate people to motivate them to do the same kind of stuff he does. Does anybody have any questions for him? We're going to take a little break right after the questions and then start with Neil Nisman's talk. Yes. Uh, hacks are so important. What do you look for when you're searching for like the perfect cover-up hack? One I'll use. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, one I'll use. Uh, I, I wear a cap a lot of times, but I keep, I like this hat because it folds up easy. I can take it with me anywhere and it is, it does have a rim on it. Now when I do my gardening, I have a much larger hat that, it, but it's lightweight. It's not heavy on my head and it has a wide brim and you know, it protects me much better from the sun. The other thing you have to watch out for is the holes in the hat. If you're wearing that hat, Light's coming through the holes in the hat and it's burning your head. So uh, when I go out fishing and I know I'm going to be in the sun, I take tape and I tape those holes up. So uh, I know sunlight's not coming through there. So uh, it, it really is all about thinking and observing and you know making sure that you're protecting yourself. But more than anything else, it really is, it's the hat you put on your head. Any other questions? Yes. Every day, every day. I mean, and not only do I check my skin, but uh, I'm also very conscious that, as you can see, I have a compression bandage on because I found a lump under my arm. Because every time I go in to see this guy, he goes, are you checking yourself? Do you, do you feel your lymph nodes? You know, because when you have skin cancer, it can, if it's aggressive, it can get into your lymph, lymph system. So I found a lump under my arm, it was cancerous. But I caught it early, and uh, I've been two years uh, without a, without a cancer. So, yes. When you found that lymph node, was it fairly easy for you to feel that? Because I know when I get checked, they really go up under your arms and they really, really go deep to feel those lymph I I can say no. As a matter of fact, I was uh, the Friday before I found it. Uh, I found it on a Sunday. I was uh, up at Penn at the transplant uh, clinic 
and they had checked me and they didn't find it. And I found it Sunday and when I got into my doctor, my, my primary care physician Monday, he said, if you hadn't shown me where it's at, he says, I never would have found it. And that, that's a common theme. It's the same as detecting on your skin. You're the ones who, we're the ones who know our bodies best. We get to see it every day. So if you know what to look for, for sure you're going to be better at finding it. It's just too easy for me or any of your other doctors to, to miss something. We're going to do our best job for you, but it, it's much more powerful if you're taking charge like Mr. Truitt did. Now, it was, it was a small, soft uh, bump, yes, and, uh, you know, but, but I, I know my body because, like I said, every, every time I shower, I got to rub myself with soap anyway, so, I, I, you know, I might as well check myself, and, and that's what I did, and I said, hmm, that feels funny, you know, and kept feeling it, and I said, that's, that wasn't there before, and that was the key. I know it wasn't there before. Well, let, let's, uh, let's take about a three to four minute break, stretch your legs, take a bathroom break, and then when we get back, um, Neil Nisnan is going to give his talk on, you know, we know what to do, why don't we do it? Why, how, how, do we, how do we change our behaviors so we're all behaving like Mr. Truitt? <clears throat>